the Bible to the cross from the cross. Every Bible story has three components. First, God's love. Second, God's compassion. Third, God's miracle. Opening your Bible opens miracles. The Bible as one story is holy enough in our lives. Day 91, 1 Samuel 11 to 12. Samuel's retirement speech. Thanks to the help, Saul extended to Jabesh Gilead that faced a crisis, Saul earned the people's trust and the royal rule was launched in a full scale. First point, the people of Ammon who were not educated once again besieged Jabesh Gilead. Even after becoming appointed as king, Saul went back to his hometown and went along with his everyday life. But then there was the incident of the people of Ammon besieging Jabesh Gilead. This was the second time they attacked. The first was back in the era of judges, and the second was this instance. The reason Ammon attacked Jabesh Gilead was because their king misunderstood the historical facts about the land east to the Jordan. When this instance became a serious matter, it was a soul to stand up as the king and make a decision. Second point, Saul used the incident of Jabesh Gilead to kickstart his monarchy. The people of Jabesh Gilead begged to the king of Ammon to save them, offering tribute and also willingly surrendering. But the king of Ammon threatened that he would gouge out all the right eyes of the Jabesh Gilead people. When Saul heard of this, he immediately took his oxen and carried up into twelve and sent it to all the twelve tribes. The catchy phrase Saul sent out was to follow Samuel and Saul. Such excellent leadership brought all the tribes together and they were ultimately able to gain great victory. Third point, the people of Jabesh Gilead remembered Saul's health for a very long time. The people of Jabesh Gilead never forgot Saul's health. This was the message that Saul sent to the people of Jabesh Gilead. By the time the sun is hot tomorrow, you will be rescued. When the people heard this, they were elated. Forty years after this incident, Saul and his three sons were killed and hung on the street. The people of Jabesh Gilead collected all the bodies together and gave them a proper burial. Fourth point, Samuel said his farewell speech in Gilgal. When the time came, Samuel appointed Saul in Gilgal and then retired. He made his final farewell speech in Gilgal. Gilgal was one of the locations where Samuel taught the Mitzvah generation about a kingdom of priests. Gilgal was also the place where Joshua and the people of Israel carried out circumcision during the process of conquering Canaan. Gilgal became the place where the first king of Israel was appointed. Samuel congratulated the soul in becoming king. Samuel also used this opportunity to proclaim to the people that during his leadership, he did not take a single donkey from them in order to be faithful to a kingdom of priests. Fifth point. Samuel once again points out the wrongs of monarchy through the miracle of hail and rain. After proclaiming to the people that he was a fair and righteous leader to them, Samuel went on with the ceremony. Samuel gave a speech 
reminding the people of the past 500 years history of a kingdom of priests and how the people were to remember God's blessings. Next, Samuel told the people that Saul was appointed by God, but he also added that it was the role of the people to request a king in the first place. Samuel also emphasized to the people that although God had given them a king, they were still to focus on a kingdom of priests and follow in the laws. Otherwise, they would be punished. Day 92, 1 Samuel 13 to 14, the start of the 500 years of monarchy. Saul was scared of the people more than God and committed the sin of making the burnt offering himself. This disappointed God greatly. First point. The 500 years of monarchy starts with Saul and ends with Zedekiah. The Old Testament contains 39 books and they can be broken down into the Pentateuch, the 500 years of monarchy and the seven books during the Persian Empire. To look into the more specific details of the 500 years of monarchy, in terms of prophets, the start was Samuel and the end was Jeremiah. In terms of kings, the start was Saul and the end was Zedekiah. The 500 years were a continuation of opposition and cooperation between prophets and kings. The 500 years experienced two major divisions, one after the death of Saul and the other after the death of Solomon. Second point, the first king Saul moved closer to the people and further away from God. After Saul was appointed king, he was unable to assert authority straight away. Moreover, there were some people who did not accept Saul as their king. The incident of Jabesh Gilead became the turning point for Saul to start his monarchy. At first, Saul was a very decent king. But after two years, the Philistines attacked and so Saul prepared 3,000 soldiers as his personal bodyguards. Saul furthermore recruited more soldiers. But when the Israelite army came face to face with the Philistine army, they hid to the east of the Jordan. Philistine had an incomparable number to them. When such a situation hit Saul, he first had to make an offering. But when Samuel did not appear at the promised time, Saul went ahead and made the offering himself. Seen from the perspective of a kingdom of priests, this was a huge sin. It was crucial that the offering was conducted by a priest. When Samuel rebuked Saul about this, Saul did not repent. This became the start of Saul moving further away from God. Third point. More so than being interested in making the offering, Saul was interested in gaining victory. Out of the five offerings in a kingdom of priests, the burnt offering symbolized the life and the fellowship offering symbolized peace with neighbors. As such, these offerings were not to be used for the purpose of winning wars. Therefore, when Samuel saw Saul making an offering with the purpose to win war, Samuel prophesied about the end to his lure. Fourth point, the first person Jonathan found to be the same in heart as him was the one who carried his weapon. The son of Saul, Jonathan, always looked out for someone who served a kingdom of priests. 
the first person Jonathan came across was the one who held his weapon, and the second person he came across was David. When battle broke out against the Philistines, Jonathan went out to fight with the one who carried his weapon. It was unlikely that the Israelites could win the Philistines with their sword and spear, but Jonathan had faith that battles belonged to God. The one who carried Jonathan's weapon went out during the first battle against the Philistines and brought victory. Jonathan and Jonathan's weapon bearer showed much courage during the first battle, which made them fearful to the Philistines. Fifth point, Samuel broke the soul's wrongful offering, and the people broke the soul's order. Saul made two major mistakes while conducting the war between the Philistines. The first was that he failed to believe in the miracle that Gideon and his 300 soldiers experienced. In other words, Saul did not believe in the miracle of a kingdom of priests, and so he made the mistake of conducting the offering himself in order to hold the Israel soldiers. The second mistake Saul made was ordering to the people to fast during war. Fasting made the Israel soldiers weak, which of course did not help in war. This furthermore led to the soldiers hunting for animals and eating their blood. Moreover, Jonathan, who did not know about the soul's orders, almost died because of it. Jonathan was just about able to save his life. As such, Saul made some very stupid decisions during the battle with the Philistines. Day 19.3 1 Samuel 15-16 Saul's abuse of political power Saul disobeyed the will of God who commanded him to completely destroy the Amalekites, and so God chose David as the next king. First point. The way of Amalek's life had not changed in the past 500 years. The Amalekites were those who attacked the weaker people who fell behind during Exodus. Thus, God told the Israelites not to forget about the Amalekites. God told the Israelites to kill them once they settled into Canaan. 500 years from then, Israel had grown into a strong community on the shore. It was time for the people to put an end to the Amalekites. The Amalekites not only attacked Israel during Exodus, but they continued to attack them all throughout the next 500 years. So, God of justice commanded that they be punished for their actions. Saul attacked the Amalekites and seized victory, but he failed to obey God completely. Saul did not annihilate them as God had commanded. Saul now cared more about his image to the people of Israel, more so than obeying God. He had moved away from God and started living according to his will. Second point, Samuel and Saul left each other. Saul's disappointing moment can be found when he refused to accept his mistakes and made the people of Israel bear the responsibility. He did not repent and only cared about how he appeared to the people. He even went as far as erecting an honorary statue for himself after the battle with the Amalekites. Moreover, Saul called the people his people rather than acknowledging them as God's people in a kingdom of priests. Thus, God made up his mind to put an end to Saul's monarchy. Third point. 
third point, Saul, who now had nothing holding him back, had no reason not to kill Samuel in order to maintain his power. When Samuel found out that God had decided to put an end to Saul's monarchy, Samuel grieved for a whole day. So God said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him king over Israel? Fill your hold with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chose one of his sons to be king. But Samuel replied, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. This shows how, since Saul and Samuel left each other, Saul had been using his political powers to spy on Samuel's every move. Amid such danger, Samuel went to Bethlehem. But when the elders of Bethlehem saw Samuel, they were unable to hide their fear. Why did the elders show fear? This was because Saul had been exerting fearful politics. The entire land knew about how much Saul had changed. This shows why Samuel hesitated before going to Bethlehem. Fourth point, Jesse raised all his sons to be suitable as a king in a kingdom of priestess. A historical day arrived for the household of Jesse in Bethlehem. When Samuel saw Jesse's first son, he was greatly impressed. He also saw the last of Jesse's sons, and he was very impressed. But God rejected all of them. Samuel asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? And so Jesse replied, There is still the youngest. He is tending the sheep. So Samuel called for him and said that he would not eat until he arrived. Because of this, Jesse stopped everything and had David come to the house. David was tending sheep when he was called. When he came in, he was appointed as king. To David, this was an unforeseeable instant, but to God, this had been in the works for a while. Fifth point, David protected his father's property and God's people with his sling and stones. David spent his teen years tending sheep in the fields. He used his time to protect his father's flock by practicing slinging stones. He had practiced so much that he had the skill to hit exactly where he aimed. David, with his refined skills, was able to protect Israel. Such efforts of David was what made God choose him as king. God knew that David would protect God's property, the way David protected his father Jesse's property. Day 94, 1 Samuel 17-18 The reason Goliath is so famous. Recognizing David, who defeated Goliath with faith and courage, Jonathan loved him as his own. First point. The 40 days of fear at Ephesus Damim led to the song Thousands and Tens of Thousands. During the early years of Saul's monarchy, the Philistines attacked. After some time, they came to attack again, but this time with a mighty warrior named Goliath. When Saul turned eight years old, he still battled against the Philistines, and this ultimately was the reason behind his death. The content of the Philistines attacking Israel for the second time during Saul's monarchy can be found in 1 Samuel 17 verses 4 to 7. When the situation became serious, Saul announced that he would free the person to win Goliath from paying tax, be presented with the king's gift, 
and also be given the king's daughter's hand in marriage. A lot of people would have been tempted by the offer, but no offer was as valuable as their own life. Thus, the situation continued for 40 days in Ephesus Damim, with no one volunteering to fight Goliath. It was at this point that David emerged and fought against Goliath. The reason we still talk about the fight between David and Goliath is not simply down to their difference in size. Goliath has been famous for the last 3,000 years because he lost to someone he definitely should have won outright. This incident became so famous that it started the famous song Saul killed thousands and David killed tens of thousands. Second point, David experienced the lion's clutches, Goliath's and also Saul's rotten politics. Before turning 30, David had three trials in becoming king. God had already selected David to become the next king when David was a teen. The first trial David had was between the lions and the bears, whilst protecting his father's sheep. The weapon he used then was a stone and a sling. The second trial David had was with Goliath. The weapon used then was also a stone and sling. The third trial proved to be the most difficult. David was not able to use a stone and sling but had to face the political power of Saul. The song made by the woman saying that Saul killed thousands, whereas David killed tens of thousands, started the burning jealousy inside Saul. Third so point, David and Jonathan met eye to eye with their faith that the battle belongs to God. Jonathan had said to his weapon bearer, during the fight with the Philistines in the early days. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up, because that will be our sign, that the Lord has given them into our hands. Fast forward to Ephesus Damim. David said to Goliath that he would die today, because he rebuked God. He proclaimed to Goliath that battles belong to God. When Jonathan saw this, it was like seeing his old self. Jonathan was not only surprised at David's sling skills, but also at what he said. From then on, Jonathan loved David as his own. Battles belong to God. Both Jonathan and David knew and believed this. Fourth point, with Jonathan's suggestion, Jonathan and David made a covenant. When Jonathan saw David defeating Goliath, he proposed to David to make a covenant. Jonathan kept his covenant until the day he died. Seen from the perspective of status, it was remarkable that a prince and a ship tender made a covenant. David also kept his covenant with Jonathan until the very end. After Jonathan's death, David brought in Jonathan's son, who had a disability in his leg and had him eat with the royal family for the rest of his life. David showed his loyalty towards Jonathan until the very end through Jonathan's son. Fifth point. Saul tried to use his daughter Michal to kill David. At first, Saul had a high regard for David. However, after hearing the songs sung by the woman, Saul's jealousy could not be overcome and so he planned to kill David. With Samuel no longer beside him, Saul was all the more nervous of his status. Saul tried to kill David with a spear, but David was able to dodge past it. 
Saul continuously tried to kill David until one day he tried to use his daughter Michal to kill him. Saul even sent David to fight with the Philistines in order to have him killed. Day 95, 1 Samuel 19, Psalm 59. Two reasons David did not go against Saul. Whilst fleeing from Saul's jealousy, David received training for a very long time in order to become a good and fair king to Israel. First point. Every time Saul tried to coincidentally kill David, he failed. Saul did everything he could think of in order to coincidentally kill David. He even went as far as to use his daughter's love. It did not matter to Saul that his daughter loved David, nor the fact that David was loyal to him. However, every time Saul tried to kill him, David courageously came out of it. When his plans failed, Saul decided that he would no longer try to be subtle about it. Second point, Saul commanded all his men to kill David. Despite the fact that David was the most loyal soldier, national hero, and the man that his own daughter loved, none of this stopped Saul from publicly trying to kill David. When Jonathan heard of this, he made David run away. And in the meantime, he tried to convince his father. When Saul heard of Jonathan, he changed his mind for a little while. However, when David came back with victory from the Philistine once again, Saul's mind rapidly changed and had the heart to kill. When things were bad for David, the only thing he could think of was Samuel. So he quickly went to seek Samuel. But Saul tried to follow and kill David. Saul went as far as to go after David himself to kill him. David had no option but to run away from Saul. Third point. Instead of fighting with Saul, David chose to run away for two reasons. David had the experience of fighting with bears, lions, and also Goliaths. But David chose not to fight with Saul for two reasons. The first reason was because of a kingdom of priests. David could not ignore the fact that Saul had been appointed by God and so to David, the only person who had the right to kill him was God. The second reason was because of Saul's abuse of political power. Indeed, fighting against Saul's political power was much more difficult than fighting with lions or bears. Fourth point, there were still people who wanted to protect David. Despite the king publicly announcing that he wanted to kill David, there were still those who wanted to protect him. A few of them were Jonathan, Michael, and Samuel. David went to a place called Naoth to escape from Saul. This was a place Samuel went previously to teach the people about a kingdom of priests. Fifth point, when all became a dead end, David prayed to God in heaven. Because of Saul, David had come to a dead end. At this point, David prayed to God in heaven. Psalms were written in order to praise and glorify God. Out of the 150 Psalms, 73 were written by David alone. If we are able to see the political side of David through 1 and 2 Samuel, we can see the man of God in Psalms. Day 96, 1 Samuel 20-21, Psalm 34 
offering the heaven through prayer. David, who fled to the Philistines through the land of Nob, saved his life by pretending to be insane in the face of crisis and then built up his broken self-esteem with prayer. First point. The covenant between David and Jonathan overcame the logistics of political power. David and Jonathan met for the first time in Ephesus Stamin, where they made a covenant. The covenant made between these two can be seen as one of the most beautiful covenants made between people. The covenant was made after David killed Goliath. Jonathan was someone who always prioritized the honor of God, and so when he met someone who valued God's honor more than he did, he was utterly blown away. Jonathan therefore tried his best to protect David from his father Saul. When Jonathan realized that he could not stop his father, he helped David escape and made another covenant with him. When they reunited in the desert, David and Jonathan were able to confirm their lasting covenant, and it was here that Jonathan knew that David was going to be the next king. When Jonathan died in the hands of the Philistines, David truly grieved. David found Jonathan's son, and ensured that he ate with the royal family in order to keep his covenant. A few hundred years ago, Jacob's two sons, Judah and Benjamin, showed beautiful brotherly love when Judah volunteered to stay as a slave instead of Benjamin. A few hundred years later, Jonathan from the tribe of Benjamin and David from the tribe of Judah showed everlasting friendship. Years later, when the twelve tribes became divided, the tribe of Judah and Benjamin stuck together and formed South Judah. As such, the relationship between Judah and Benjamin tribes had a lasting and a strong bond. Second point, David and Jonathan shed sad tears when they had to separate. The reason Saul decided to kill David was because of Samuel's prophecy and Saul's confirmation of this prophecy. Samuel said, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. So when Saul decided David definitely had to die, there was nothing Jonathan can do to stop him. But Jonathan tried to test his father one last time and then told David that they should decide what he was to do from now. Saul asked about David during the royal dinner when he saw that he was missing, to which Jonathan replied that David had asked for his pardon to return home. At this, Saul told Jonathan his strong feelings towards killing David. Jonathan was truly able to confirm that his father was going to try to kill David no matter what. So he went and told David to flee with a heavy heart. Not having a choice, David agreed, and the two friends stood in sorrow and confirmed their covenant whilst shedding tears. Third point, Saul killed 85 priests in Nob for the reason that they gave David a piece of bread. Whilst learning away from Saul, David went to Nob where priest Ahimelech was. When Ahimelech saw David, he trembled in fear. In order to calm him down, David hid the reason he came. David answered Ahimelech the priest, The king sent me on a mission and said to me, No one is to know anything about the mission I am sending you on. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain price. 
David was able to receive some bread by telling this lie. Some time later, Saul came to this place and killed 85 Philistines for the reason that they helped David. This made the headlines to everyone, and it was indeed a political statement that anyone who helped David was to be put to death by the king. Fourth point, David flees to the west side of the Philistine land in order to escape from Saul. After receiving some bread from Nob, David fled away from Israel as it was a very dangerous place for him. David went to the hometown of Goliath, and although it was an extremely dangerous place, the reason he went to Gath was because it was still close to Israel but outside its borders at the same time. But when the Philistine soldiers saw David, they were shocked. David was not just here for political exile, but was someone that had killed their hero Goliath. When David knew how dangerous the situation was, he pretended to be insane. David knew that the king would not kill someone they thought was insane, and so he did his best to look and appear insane. Fifth point. After saving his life from acting insane, David confessed that the lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. After escaping from Saul, David went to the Philistine land and pretended to be insane in order to save his life. He acted so well that the king was convinced. David used it to his advantage that kings do not pain themselves by curing insane people, although David's self-esteem was rock bottom. David praised God, which can be seen in Psalm 34. David confessed that lions may grow weak, but those who seek God lack no good thing. When David reached a dead end, David opened the doors of heaven and prayed to God. David was someone who reached out to God at all times. Day 97, 1 Samuel 22, Psalm 52 New political power group of 400 David who ran away to Moab, returned to Judah in obedience to God, while Saul's eyes were blinded due to greed for power. First point, David comes across 400 distressed people at Adullam. David managed to regain his self-esteem through believing in God, and now he left the Philistine land and headed towards Adullam to hide. When people who were in a similar situation to him in terms of being in distress or in debt heard this, they came to him. These 400 people were also ones who had to escape from Saul's political threat. David now had 400 people to look after as well as himself. And so he went to Moab to hide. But God told David to return to Judah. It was important for God that David saw just how brutal Saul ruled the country and just how much he abused his political power. David obeyed and returned to Judah. Second point. After hiding in the west side of the Philistine country, this time David went to the east side of Moab to hide. When David went to the west side of the Philistine country to hide, he was alone. But when he went to the east side of Moab, he had 400 people with him at his care. Thankfully, Moab accepted David and ensured his protection. Presumably, 
David selected Moab as it was the land of Ruth. Moab for the Moab did not reach his souls later, unlike the Philistines. Third point, David started listening to the words of the prophet. David had made the decision to flee to Moab to protect him, and also the 400 that he took care of. But God had a different plan in mind. God did not want David to find protection in Moab, but rather in God. David listened to the words of prophet God and returned to Judah despite the dangers. God made sure that before David sat on the throne, he was fully trained. Fourth point, the place David had to be was not Philistine or Moab, but right in front of Saul's political threat. David and his 400 companions returned from Moab, and this information reached Saul. When Saul heard this, he immediately recruited men from his own tribe. Now that David had his following of 400, the whole situation became more serious and larger in scale. Fifth point, David once again prayed to God in heaven. David listened to the words of a prophet God and left Moab to come back to Judah. When David heard that Saul had killed Ahimelech and the 85 priests who had helped him, he could not contain his anger and cried out to God. The content of David's prayer can be seen in Psalm 52 verses 1 to 9. Day 98, 1 Samuel 23 to 24, Psalm 57. God is the one who appoints. David did not kill Saul because he honored God's authority as the one who appoints, although the opportunity to kill Saul away from his 3,000 soldiers came to him. First point, David killed Goliath, which started the song, Saul killed thousands and David killed tens of thousands, and Saul killed 85 priests and made the entire country into vessel bros. The prophet God told David to return to Judah, and so David left Boab and came back with the 400. But at that point, the Philistine army came and attacked Kaira. When David heard of this, he asked the people who were with him to go with him and save Kaira. David said that it was important for them to go and save the people there, despite everything that was going on. Kaira was a land that was given to the tribe of Judah, and David felt bad as Judah during those days was suffering due to Saul. But what happened afterwards was devastating. David went to help Kayla, but the people of Kayla informed Saul of David's whereabouts rather than thanking him. This was all because the people deeply feared Saul after they heard about the killing of the eight five priests. Around this time, the 400 that had been accompanying David grew into 600. Second point, David and Jonathan met for the last time in the desert. David and his people left Kaila and this time went towards the desert to hide. When Jonathan heard of this, he secretly headed towards the desert to meet with David. When they met, David was able to gain strength from Jonathan. Jonathan told David to hold on to his belief in God, not to be afraid and also that his father Saul would not be able to harm him. Jonathan had risked his own life by coming to see David. He shared in David's sorrow and situation. Third point. 
Soul took three thousand able young soldiers near where David's six hundred untrained men were staying. Soul took three thousand young able soldiers with him to capture David, and to the rest of the country, he commanded them to report straight away if they sighted him. Saul completely lined the country with fear and threat. This time round, Saul and his men went to where David and his six hundred men were staying. David and his people quickly tried to escape. Just as they were about to come face to face with Saul and his trained men, news broke out that the Philistines had attacked. God used. The Philistines to protect David. Fourth point: David cut off a corner from Saul's love and then felt guilty. After the battle with the Philistine, Saul came back to hunt for David with his thirty thousand tried men. Suddenly, Saul came into the cave where David and his people were hiding. David's heart would have throbbed like crazy, but strangely, Saul came into the cave all by himself without any of his guards. This was an opportunity for David to kill Saul. It meant that David would no longer have to hide or live in fear of being killed. Moreover, David could have ended the terrible monarchy of Saul, but David did not kill Saul. Until the very end, he fully acknowledged that God had appointed Saul as king. So David did not cut Saul's throat, but rather a corner of his robe. But he regretted even doing this. Afterwards, David cried out his innocence to Saul. At this, Saul, for a moment, apologized to David. Saul admitted. That David was right, but he did not repent of his sins. Fifth point: David once again experienced God's vision of blessing all nations through a kingdom of priests in the desert of En Gedi. David was hiding in a cave when Saul happened to walk in. The tables had turned, and this time David had the sword to kill Saul. In that cave, David instead turned to God and focused on his vision. David once again renewed in him God's vision of blessing all nations through a kingdom of priests. Psalm fifty-seven records David's praise to God from inside the cave. Day ninety-nine, one Samuel twenty-five to twenty-six. Psalm fifty-four. The reason God put three thousand men to sleep. Saul kept chasing David. When one day God made Saul sleep, so that he could test David. But David made the choice of faith by sparing Saul's life again. First point: The Israel relation divided into two. In terms of their opinions on David, during the ten years David was learning away from Saul, the people of Israel started to form their opinions about him. At first, David was a national hero who saved them from Goliath and the Philistines, but after Saul's twisted politics, to some people. David became a learning fugitive, as can be seen through Nabal's words. However, as time passed, people started to form different opinions. When the people saw that David came to save Kayla, even in the midst of learning away, those who misunderstood him began to change their minds. But to some, David was still a figure of a threat. We can see the polar opposites through Abigail and Nabal when it came to David and how he was perceived. Second point: 
During his days of learning away, David came across Doeg, Nabal, and also countless others. During the ten years of learning away from Saul, David met countless people, including Doeg, Nabal, and countless others. The case of Nabal truly shows how Saul's politics did indeed have an impact on some people. Nabal was a rich man, and it came time for him to share his ship. When David heard of this, he asked politely for payment for his part of the work in tending the flock. David sent a messenger to Nabal to ask for some food in return for protecting Nabal's property. But Nabal rebuked David instead. He looked down on David, who had saved the country from Goliath and who used to be a commander of the national army. Nabal only considered that David was a runaway. David therefore tried to kill Nabal. Third point, David meets Abigail during his days of learning away. When Abigail heard that David was extremely angry with her husband Nabal, she appeared before him and calmed him down. When the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler of Israel, my Lord will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself. And when the Lord your God has brought my Lord success, remember your servant. Abigail told David not to let things get in his way in the long term and that he was going to end up king anyway. Her wise words soothed David in that he would not have to be responsible for killing people out of personal anger during his fugitive days. David listened to her and expressed thanks. Some time later, Nabal died, and David took Abigail as his wife. Fourth point, the people once again reported David to Saul. It became a norm for the people to report David to Saul if they saw him. After the incident with Nabal, the people once again reported David to Saul. This was the second time the people of Judah reported David. So, Saul and his 3,000 men once again came to kill David. Saul seduced the people by saying that anyone who reported would be given high-ranking positions and property and that anyone who hid David would be killed like the 85 priests. Such threats meant that the people had a better little choice but to report David if they saw him. Fifth point, God made Saul's 3,000 men fall asleep and then tested David. He came to the last meeting between David and Saul. God used this opportunity to test David. God made Saul and his men fall into a deep sleep. It was the perfect opportunity for David to kill Saul. This would not have been a possible scenario if God had not made it for David. This was indeed God's test. But David did not kill Saul and respected that God had appointed Saul. God would have been extremely pleased by this. Although Saul apologized to David, he tried to kill him again. So David had to run away to Philistia. Day 100, 1 Samuel 27 to 31. Sad news that reached the outsider David. While David was in the land of the Philistines' undefection, a war broke out between Israel and the Philistines, and the period of Saul came to a cross. First point. 
David made a second political negotiation with the Philistine king and so was able to stay there for a second political exile. Eight years ago, David fled to the land of the Philistines without any backup plan and had to go as far as acting insane in order to keep himself alive. But after eight years, David had a group of his own followers and had enough political status to make a negotiation with the Philistine king. This time around, he officially negotiated with the Philistine king to let him and his 600 men come for exile in their country. David asked the king of Gath in Philistine, whose name was Akishi, to enable him and his men to live in Ziklag, which was away from where the king was living. For Akishi, if David was on the outskirts of the country, he would be able to protect that side. For David, due to the location of Ziklag being geographically right next to Israel, David would be able to maintain relations. So it was a good deal on both ends. Ziklag was initially given to the tribe of Judah and then given to the tribe of Simeon. But even until the days of Saul, this part of land was still unconquered and in the hands of the Philistines. David stayed there for a year and four months and after that, the land became the property of the tribe of Judah. Even afterwards, when Babylon ruled, the land of Ziklag became the land for the tribe of Judah. David and his men stayed in Ziklag for a year and four months and on the surface, it appeared that David was doing the Philistines a favor, but this was not the case. This was indeed a political deal. Second point, as Saul was unable to persuade David unto his side, he ended up seeking a spirit conjurer. Saul had to deal with the Philistines attacking Israel all throughout his monarchy. David was outstanding against the Philistines, so it really would have been in Saul's best interests to keep David on his side. He moreover would not have had to seek a spirit conjurer before heading for battle. The reason Saul once again faced the battle with the Philistines was because the Philistines were confident that they would be able to win Israel, as they did not have David on their side, with David being in the land of the Philistines for exile. This battle was the battle of Gilboa between Israel and the Philistines. When things became serious for Saul, he turned to God, but God had already left Saul. Saul was not able to hear a single answer. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him, by dreams or urim or prophets. Saul therefore turned to a spirit conjurer. Indeed, Saul did something he really should not have done as a citizen of a kingdom of priests. During the early days of Saul's monarchy, he was obedient to God, but he had changed so much that he went as far as to look for other spirits. This was incredibly unfortunate. Third point, David once pretended to be insane and then pretended to be royal in front of the king of Philistine in order to save his life. During the year and four months David was in Ziklag, he faced another dangerous situation. When the Philistines went to war against Israel, 
David was commanded to join the battle. This was indeed a huge conflict of interest scenario during David's political life. When Akish commanded all the soldiers to align for battle, David had to take his 600 men and be on standby. The fact that David was an exile meant that he really was not at liberty to make up his own mind. But luckily, the people of Philistine did not want David to be with them. They requested to Akishi that David and his men return to Jiglak, and so the king did as the people requested. Because this battle against Israel involved five countries, Akish was not in the position to take full control. Akish would have internally regretted that David could not be with them, although David acted as if he was offended. He was actually relieved of this outcome. Thankfully, he was able to get out of this situation. Fourth point, David is faced with the threat of internal conflict after returning from almost battling with Israel. David almost faced the situation of fighting against Israel, but luckily he was able to escape and go back to Sigla. David had experienced countless hardships during his lifetime, but this instance of almost having to fight with his own people could have ended up being his worst. David took the 600 men who were with him to Ziklag, but there he faced another difficult situation. During the three days, David went to see King Akishi. The Amalekites had seized Ziklag and were attacking the area. Fortunately, there were no dead bodies in Zigla. This showed that no one had been killed. The Amalekites had spared their lives in order to sell them as slaves. When the 600 men came back to find that their families were not there, they blamed David and tried to stone him. This was an internal disaster. Amidst such a situation, David once again turned to God and asked for courage. After hearing God's answer, David went with the men to attack the Amalekites in order to bring back the people. In the process of doing so, 200 became so exhausted that they had to be left behind. But thankfully, David came across an Egyptian boy who informed him of how to find the Amalekites. In the end, David was able to save the people as well as bring back an enormous amount of goods. When the people came back, some said to David that the 200 who did not go with them should not receive the goods. But David persuaded them and they all ended up getting a share. David furthermore provided shares for the people of Judah, which strengthened their relationship. Fifth point, Saul, who tried to kill Samuel and David, ended his own life at the age of 80. Saul, who was the first king of Israel, spent the last 40 years doing whatever he could to maintain his political power. He abused his political power to the full extent and even tried to kill Samuel and David in doing so. But Saul ended his own life as well as his three sons being killed by the Philistines. The Philistines saw great victory at the Battle of Gilboa. Coming to the end of Saul's life will reflect on his early days, when God chose him due to his humble and obedient character. Indeed, Saul had forgot that all was given by God, and God had all the authority to take it away from him. 
Day 101 to Samuel 1 to 2. David, who became the king of South Judah. While David was hiding in the land of the Philistines, a war broke out between Israel and the Philistines, and the rule of Saul came to a cross. First point. After the death of Saul, Israel became divided into two nations for the first time. After the death of Saul and his three sons at the Battle of Gilboa, Israel faced great internal struggles. But Abner, who was the commander of Saul's army, used this as an opportunity to take political power. Only one of Saul's sons, called Isibothet, had survived, and so Abner used him as the political scarecrow and took actual control. This led to the division of the country. Abuna had used Ishibothet to go to Mahanaim to start his own political party. At this time, David became the king of the tribe of Judah. As such, after the death of Saul, the twelve tribes of Israel was divided into two for seven years and six months. This was the first segment of Israel experiencing division. The second division was after the death of Solomon. Second point. David lamented over Saul's death and honored him. After fighting against the Amalekites, David returned to Jiglak and heard of Saul's death three days later. Despite Saul making his life utterly miserable, David still lamented over his death. He cried with the people of Judah to mourn for the great warrior Saul. David, moreover, cried over the death of Jonathan and made a lamenting song for the people to sing. David even killed the young man who informed him of Saul's death. The young man had lied that he had killed Saul, although he had not. He had thought that David might reward him if he told this lie. But David ended up killing him for this lie. Third point. After being anointed by Samuel many years ago, David became the king of Judah and was anointed for the second time. Before David fought Goliath, he was a boy living in Bethlehem, tending to his father's sheep. This was when Samuel came and anointed him as the next king of Israel. Fifteen years from then, David became anointed for the second time as the king of Judah. The reason he became the king only of Judah was because of Abner who had taken political control after the death of Saul. Abuna, moreover, made the new capital Mahanaim, which put Judah more at risk from the Philistines. The fact that David shared the battle spoils with the people of Judah also contributed to the reason of him becoming anointed as their king. Fourth point. The first thing David did as a king of Judah was to bless the people of Jabesh Gilead. Forty years ago, Saul saved the people of Jabesh Gilead. But after this instant, Saul completely changed and anyone could see that Saul's politics had become perverted and corrupt. Despite this, the people of Jabesh Gilead never forgot that Saul had saved them, and when Saul and his three sons died, they gathered all their bodies and gave them a make-do burial. At this point, David became the king of Judah, and the first thing he did as king was to bless the people of Jabesh Gilead. David moreover promised them that they would be protected by David for their good deed. Fifth point. 
The division of Israel lasted for seven years and conflict between them also followed. The corrupt politics of Saul did not end with his death. The tribe of Benjamin, who had been Saul's main power base, now went to Abner with the tribe of Judah supporting David. An argument broke out as to which side would own the pool of Gibeah. The division caused unnecessary conflict between the people, and one of the results of this was the death of 360 plus 20 young men. This grew into a serious fight with the tribe of Judah seeing victory. Joab's brother Asael, who was also a general of Judah, died. After the battle, Abner was on his way north when Asael tried to kill him. Asael blamed Abner for starting this fight in the first place. Abner did not want to make trouble with Joab and so tried not to kill his brother Asael. But when Asael kept trying to kill him, he had no choice but to strike first. This instant, write a letter to Joab, killing Abner in order to avenge his brother. Day 102, 2 Samuel chapter 3 to chapter 5, verse 5. David's third anointment and the establishment of the unified dynasty. David, who overcame the political crisis with sincerity, was anointed the third time and became king of the United Kingdom of Israel. First point. After seven years and six months of division, David and Abner agreed on unification. After the death of Saul, Saul's command of the army, Abner, had taken control of the eleven tribes through the legitimacy of Saul's son, and for seven years and six months, the country was divided into two. David waited for the day for the country to be unified. The reason Saul's family had crumbled was due to Isabothas and Abner. At first, Abner tried to take over North Israel. However, Abner took Saul's concubine and Ishibotheth criticized him for this. This was an act of treason back in those days. Abner reacted badly to this criticism. This eventually caused Abner to take down Saul's household and reach out to David. Thinking Ishibotheth humiliated him, Abner came secretly to David to negotiate unification. What Abner proposed was for David to rule over the twelve tribes and for him to be second in command. David said yes to Abner's proposition on the condition that he brought back David's wife Michal. David also proposed making this official with Ishbotheth. All of this was furthermore to be confirmed with the elders. So Abner had to go and settle this all with the tribe of Benjamin. At last, the country was about to be united. Second point. The incident of Joab murdering Abner grew into a dangerous conflict between the tribes of Israel. When David and Abner were secretly negotiating unification, Joab was not with them, but he didn't know about this meeting. So Joab tried to kill Abner secretly. Joab wanted to kill Abner for two reasons. The first was because if Abner became second in command, then he would be downgraded to the third in command, and he did not want this. The second was because he wanted to avenge his brother who was killed by Abner. Joab moreover believed that even if he killed Abner, David would not do anything to him. Third point. Within three days, 
David was able to reveal to the entire Israel that the death of Abner was carried out by Joab alone. The death of Abner proved to be another huge instance in David's political life. Later on, the coup d'etat by Absalom became another dangerous instance to David. The instance of Abner's death could have resulted in a deep and fatal misunderstanding between the 11 tribes. The people could have misunderstood that Abner wanted to negotiate with David, but David secretly killed him. This could have gone as far as the tribe of Judah turning their back on David. But David very wisely handled the situation. Within three days, the first thing David did was to curse Joab. The second thing he did was to make a lamenting song for Abner, and he himself read the funeral. When the people heard the lamenting song, their hearts opened up to David. David fasted during the process of Abner's funeral. Thus, within three days, the people knew that Joab murdered Abner alone. This opened the first possibility of the twelve tribes uniting. Fourth point, Ishbosheth was murdered by the sons of Rimon and this broke down the internal political power of the Benjamin tribe. When the news of Abner's sudden death reached the people, Lehman's sons from the tribe of Benjamin murdered Ishibotheth. The sons of Lehman sensed that David would be the next king, and so they quickly made the decision to act accordingly. As the young man, who had told news to David about the death of Saul, thought that he would be rewarded. The sons of Lehman also thought the same. But David rather sentenced the murderers to death, and moreover held an honorable funeral for Ishbosheth in order to respect Saul's family right until the end. Fifth point. At age 37, David became anointed as the king of all 12 tribes of Israel. David was anointed three times during his lifetime. The first was when he was a teenager and he was anointed by Samuel. The second was when he was 30 years old and he became anointed as the king of the tribe of Judah. The third was seven years and six months since being anointed as the king of Judah, and now he became the king of all of Israel. To think about it, it was not easy for one tribe to take over eleven. But David went against the oldest and did this. If David did not care for peace, then he would not have waited seven years and six months, but rather have taken an army to force unification. But he waited in order to achieve reconciliation and peace. Day 103 to Samuel chapter 5 verse 6 to chapter 6. 1,000 years long political agenda. David, who conquered Jerusalem and made it the capital, brought the Ark of God there and established the city as a new center for serving God. First point. The agenda of David's politics was to maintain a kingdom of priests for the next 1,000 years. After achieving unification, David moved the capital city to a new area. He moved the capital from Hebron to Jerusalem, and this had a few reasons. Among the reasons was that Jerusalem was geographically located at the center of the Israelite community and this made it easy for the people to gather. Jerusalem back then had the Jebusites living there, despite it having been given to the tribe of Judah. 
Thus, making Jerusalem the new capital had the intention to fulfill God's promise about land. Second point, with Jerusalem made into the new capital, David managed to fulfill God's promise about land. A thousand years prior to David making Jerusalem the new capital, Abraham was called by God to go to the land where his descendants would live. This land became conquered by Joshua 500 years later and then distributed among the people. In terms of logistics, the promised land became conquered for the first round 500 years later by Joshua and then a thousand years later by David the second time round. Third point, David set up international politics for a kingdom of priests in Jerusalem. After seven years and six months as the king of Judah, David became the king of all Israel and he moreover succeeded in making Jerusalem the new capital. David became known as a powerful king to the surrounding countries. Hiram, king of Tyre, sent cedar logs and carpenters and stone masons, and they built a palace for David. But this did not make David arrogant. He all the more praised God. David gathered the skilled workers that were scattered around in Jerusalem in order to kick start the new politics. In this process, David managed to completely ward off the Philistines. Before the battle with the Philistines, David asked God about the outcome and God guaranteed that David would win. Fourth point. Due to the death of Uzzah, David stopped the entire 30,000 soldiers from moving the Ark to Jerusalem. David had plans to move the Ark of Covenant to Jerusalem. In order to do so, David put forth 30,000 soldiers for the job, to move it from kiriath Jerim to Jerusalem. Uzzah and Ahio guide the new cart with the Ark of God on it, but when the oxen stumbled, Uzzah reached out to steady it. Because of this, God struck Uzzah down. David stopped the entire process and temporarily placed the Ark into the house of Obed-Edom. David cared more about doing God's job properly than his own reputation. This was what fundamentally made him different to Saul. Fifth point, the Ark of God, which was made 500 years ago on Mount Sinai, now settled in Jerusalem. When David heard that there was good news in the house of Obed-Edom, where the ark was placed, he attempted once more to move the ark into Jerusalem. This time around, David moved the ark according to the laws in the kingdom of priests. The descendants of Koath placed the ark over their shoulders, and every six steps they took, David made an offering to God. After all this, the ark was finally placed in Jerusalem. Day 104, 2 Samuel 7 to 10. The three conditions for the temple construction. God promised David that he would keep David's house forever. And David, who was moved by this, offered a prayer confessing himself as God's servant. First point. David, who became king, opened the new age of the Jerusalem temple, which lasted a thousand years. After learning away from Saul for ten years and then being king over the tribe of Judah for seven years and six months, David finally became king over all Israel. 
he moved to Jerusalem and now sat in his new palace. But in his heart, he felt bad that God's ark was placed in a tent when he was surrounded by cedar logs and stone mason. And so David thought of the unthinkable, something that no one for the past 500 years thought of. This was to build a home for the ark, and so began the thousand-year temple. David first told this to the prophet Nathan. Nathan told David that God was pleased with this, but that God had three conditions. The first was that God would give the design. As God had given the design to Moses 500 years ago, God was to give the design to David. The second was that David was only to prepare. The reason David was not to make the temple himself was because he had caused too much bloodshed during his life. The third was that the temple was to be built during the days of Solomon. God granted permission, but on these conditions. God also gave David the promise that the monarchy would continue in the house of David. When we think about it, Saul tried so hard to pass on his position to Jonathan. So the fact that God promised this to David was indeed astonishing. Second point, David, who was a war hero, did not build an empire. Even during his teens, David was a natural fighter. Historically, all those who were natural fighters dreamed of and then implemented in making an empire. This involved enslaving other nations and taking over other territories. But the surprising thing was that although David had the skills and manpower to make an empire, he did not. This was because he truly believed in a kingdom of priests. Third point, David emphasized righteousness and justice in his politics. God had told through Samuel the negatives of having a monarchy. And this was reflected painfully in Saul's monarchy. But David did not follow in the footsteps of Saul, and instead did the opposite to show a model for a kingdom of priests. David required righteousness and justice in his politics. In order to do so, David established a firm central organization doing what was right for all his people. He appointed Joab over the army, Jehoshaphat as the official, Zadok and Aviatha as priests, and Seraya as the secretary. Benaiah was in charge of the Kerisites and Perisites and David's sons were ministers. David made into reality what God had been envisioning since the day of Abraham. The reason David was able to do this was because he had the hopes of a kingdom of priests in his heart. Fourth point, when David became king, he embraced the tribe of Benjamin during his entire rule. Excluding Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, Saul's household became almost entirely perished. When David found out that Mephibosheth was alive, he took him into his palace in order to keep his covenant with Jonathan. David, furthermore, kept the covenant he made with Thor. David had Mephibosheth's it with him in the palace. David, moreover, even embraced Shimei, son of Gerah, who cursed David. When Abishai said he would kill Shimei, David said, What does this have to do with you, you sons of Jeruiah? What right do you have to interfere? 
Should anyone be put to death in Israel today? Don't I know that today I'm king over Israel? So the king said to Shimei, You shall not die. And the king promised him an oath. And David said that Shimei would not die. As such, David practiced justice and righteousness and tried to do the opposite to Saul. He embraced the tribe of Benjamin and tried to bring the people together. Fifth point. The Ammonites were unable to win as they did not know history and they did not know of David's abilities. Despite losing every time, the Ammonites had the habit of attacking Israel. The first time they attacked was during the era of judges. The second was after Saul became king. The third was after David had become king. The Ammonites thought that David sent envoys to explore the city and then overthrew it, when in fact David was trying to honor the death of their king. They completely misunderstood David and offended his men. And so, David commanded Joab to prepare for battle. The Aram army also got involved, but thankfully, the Israel army was able to win. After this, the Aram people made a treaty with Israel and never supported Ammon ever again. Day 105, 2 Samuel 11 to 12, Psalm 51. The letter for innocent murder. David, who committed adultery with Bathsheba, killed Uriah to cover up the sin. He was rebuked for this evil, which then he knelt down before God and truly repented. First point David murders Uriah with one letter. During the fight against Israel and Ammon, there was a short break. At the time, Job was out in the battlegrounds when David was in his palace. One day, David saw Bathsheba, despite knowing that she was the wife of his loyal servant Uriah, he called for her and made her pregnant. But David did not settle this well. He told Uriah to go to his wife but Uriah did not, as he considered his comrades who were out in the field. And so David killed Uriah in order to erase his faults. The method David used to kill Uriah was a method only the king could use. This method could be kept a secret. What David did here was so unlike him, spiteful and heartless. David used his power to make Joab a partner in crime. This was indeed a perfect crime that no one would be able to find out about. When Uriah died, David made Bathsheba his own wife and pretended as though nothing had happened. But God mentioned this crime later in Matthew chapter 1. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Second point. The prophet Nathan proclaimed opposition against David. The job of a prophet was to act as God's spokesperson and to deliver his message. This was the whole purpose of a prophet. David had to confirm with the prophet Nathan regarding his wishes to build a temple as well. David was able to go forth with his plan as Nathan told David that God permitted this. But when David committed the murder of Uriah, the prophet Nathan proclaimed opposition. We will see throughout the 500 years of monarchy how many prophets opposed the kings when they did not meet the standard of a kingdom of priests. This was the law and responsibility of the prophet. Third point, King David knelt down to repent in front of a kingdom of priests. 
different to empires, the system in a kingdom of priests meant that kings were to be rebuked when they did not follow God's laws. David had committed a huge crime, and so God told the prophet Nathan to tell David that these were his punishments. The first was that the sword would never leave his household. The second was that David's wife would also be taken from him. The third was that David's child through Bathsheba would die. The notable point here was that David confessed he had sinned. It did not matter to him at this point that he was the king. David completely confessed that he did wrong and repented. This was why God used him as his servant. Fourth point, David desired to be cleansed with hyssop in front of God. Hyssop was a plant that was grown that had an aromatic scent and purifying qualities. Hyssop was used back when the first Passover took place in Egypt. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. David confessed that his sin was so deep that he needed to be cleansed with hyssop. Thus, David was able to receive God's forgiveness and return to living as a holy citizen in the kingdom of priests. After David heard Nathan's rebuke, he completely knelt in front of God and wrote Psalm 51 to pray to God to be cleansed with his. This managed to re-strengthen his relationship with God. Fifth point, to David who repented, God sent the prophet Nathan to him once again. See, from a kingdom of priests, David is a sin of pursuing Bathsheba, and then murdering Uriah was a death penalty. But David truly repented and received God's forgiveness. Although the son born between David and Bathsheba died, God gave them another son to replace the one they had lost. While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. God once again sent the prophet Nathan and expressed his love to David. Although David committed an enormous sin, the reason God called him my servant until the end was because he repented deeply and always returned to God. Day 106, 2 Samuel 13 to 14. Terrible Brothers Feud. Enraged by Amnon, his stepbrother, who raped his sister Tamar, Absalom killed him, fled, and then returned to Jerusalem three years later. First point. The conflict between David's sons was a lot more brutal compared to the conflict between Jacob's sons. We saw how serious the conflict between Jacob's sons was in Genesis 37, verse 8, 37, verse 28, and 50, verse 15. But the conflict between David's sons was even more brutal than Jacob's sons. It went as far as David's sons Absalom murdering his stepbrother Amnon as revenge. This instant had its roots in the disaster that had taken place two years previously. Second point, Amnon, who had an evil friend, ended up getting murdered. After David murdered the innocent Uriah, David's household went down into turmoil. 
David's son Amnon loved his stepsister Tamar, but when he was unable to pursue her due to the rules of a kingdom of priests, he became ill. Amnon became so obsessed with his sister that he listened to Jonadab's foolish plan to be alone with her. Jonadab's scheme was to fool David the king. David, who had no idea about this scheme, allowed Amnon to meet his sister. David sent word to Tamar at the palace. Go to the house of your brother Amnon and prepare some food for him. When Tamar went to her brother with food, he tried to rape her, but she resisted. But because he was much stronger than her, she was raped. Right after he left her, he suddenly detested her. Indeed, David's household started to fall apart after David murdered the innocent Uriah. Third point, David who fooled Uriah later became fooled by his own son Amnon and Absalom. Jacob who fooled his father Isaac with clothes later was fooled by his sons with clothes. David also fooled Uriah. But David later became fooled by his own sons. When Tamar was raped by her brother, she put ashes on her head. Toward the ornate robe she was wearing, put her hands on her head, and wept as loudly as she could. When her brother Absalom heard of this, he consoled her. However, inside him, revenge was scheming. When David later found out about Amnon's behavior, he was furious. However, he did not punish him, and two years passed since the incident. But during the two years, Absalom was planning revenge against Amnon. So two years later, when Absalom's ship shearers were at Baal Hajar, Near the borders of Ephraim, he invited all the king's sons to come there. Absalom had planned to kill Amnon that night. On that night, Absalom's servants killed Amnon when all David's sons were present. The rest of David's sons were so shocked that they fled the area immediately. Meanwhile, Absalom fled to Geshur, and stayed there for three years. David lamented over Absalom for three years. Fourth point, Joab helped Absalom, but then later killed him. Joab, who was David's commander of the army, saw the heart of David, believed for his son Absalom. So Joab planned for Absalom's return. Joab sent someone to Tekoa and had a wise woman brought from there. Joab did his best to mend the broken relationship between David and Absalom. Although David found out about Joab's plan, he still permitted the return of Absalom. So after three years in Geshur, Absalom returned to Jerusalem. However, although David permitted Absalom's return, he did not meet with him yet. Meanwhile, Joab who had helped Absalom return to Jerusalem, later ended up killing Absalom. In the process of Absalom trying to conduct a coup d'etat. Fifth point, Absalom, who did not repent, planned a coup d'etat. Then the king summoned Absalom, and he came in and bowed down with his face to the ground before the king. And the king kissed Absalom. Although David and Absalom had not seen one another for the past five years, Absalom coming back to Jerusalem did not heal their relationship because David had not punished Absalom for killing Amnon. Absalom thought that he had not committed a crime. Indeed, father and son had very different thoughts. Absalom was already planning a coup d'etat. He now planned an opposition against his own father. Day 107, 2 Samuel 15, Psalm 3 The story of Coup de Tat 1 Absalom's Rebellion Shocked by Absalom's rebellion, which was 
thoroughly prepared, David hurriedly left Jerusalem and yet established a strategy to resist the leveling army in face. First point. The biggest problems David endured internally during his political life was firstly in Ziglag with the 600 people who tried to stone him, and secondly, the instant of Absalom's coup d'etat. The first internal danger David endured was before he became king over Judah. The second was Absalom's coup d'etat. External fights require courage, but internal fight is a whole new type of battle. The reason David managed to be God's servant right until the end was because he managed to endure these internal fights by always putting God first. Second point, Absalom used his biased judgment skills in front of the palace doors and also the instant at Hebron as the base for his coup d'etat. Absalom's coup d'etat had several stages. The first was to gather his army of followers. The second was for him to make himself the judge, state how his father had faults and how he was the suitable king. Another tool that he used was the help from a counselor. Ahithophel was David's counselor who was acknowledged for his skills. Absalom turned Ahithophel into his side and thus strengthened his chances in becoming king. Most unfortunately, Absalom used the offerings to God in Hebron for his coup d'etat. Absalom gathered 200 people for the coup d'etat. Third point, when David was chased by Saul, he at least had a rope to hang from, but when he was chased by Absalom, he had to learn barefoot. Although David experienced a great deal of hardship during his lifetime, this incident with Absalom was indeed one of his worst. But David did not complain and instead looked back on his sins with the Bathsheba and also how he failed to properly punish Amnon after he had left his sister Tamar. David also acknowledged how he did not notice that Absalom had been making opposition in Israel during the past four years. The reason why David ran out barefoot was because he did not want to make war with his own son in Jerusalem where God's presence dwelt. He also wanted to strategically think about how to handle this coup d'etat. Fourth point, whilst learning away, David knew that monarch could change any day. On his learning away from Absalom, the priest Zadok and Abi Atha followed him, carrying the ark of God with them. But David had the ark sent back to Jerusalem. The reason for doing so was because David accepted God's anger, and also because David hoped for God's forgiveness. And so he sent the ark back with the people who brought it with them. Fifth point. In order to compete with Ahithophel, David sent Hushai to Absalom. The news that Ahithophel had united with Absalom would have been the most disheartening news for David. David knew that with Ahithophel on Absalom's side, Absalom had very high chances of succeeding his coup d'etat. The only thing David was able to do was to pray to God to make Ahithophel's plans foolish. But during this disheartening situation, David came across a new opportunity. God answered his prayer by sending him Hushai. And thus, David was able to turn the tables. David convinced Hushai 
to go to Absalom and release false information. An ordinary war depends on the sword, but this war was down to the counselors. This was a war between Ahithophel and Hushai. Day 108 to Samuel 16 to 17. The story of Coup d'etat to general psychology. David who fled met two kinds of people who either helped him or cursed him. Absalom adopted Hushai's strategy instead of Ahithophel's. First point. David meets a variety of people when learning away. The first person David met learning away from Absalom was Ziba, the steward of Mephibosheth. He came to meet David with food prepared. But Ziba schemed against Mephibosheth. This was indeed wicked as Mephibosheth had a disability which made it impossible for him to follow. When David heard Ziba's words, he passed on Mephibosheth's lands to Ziba. Because David was so tired and in need of food, he made a bad decision when Ziba offered him exactly what he needed on his way. Later on, David met Shimei, who had secretly dreamed of re-raising the tribe of Benjamin as monarchies. David furthermore met people who consoled him. Overall, David met various types of people who all in the end enabled him to see God's blessing towards him. Second point. Through Shimei's curse, David considers the effects of the Kuft Tat. Shimei was from the tribe of Benjamin, who did not accept David as king. They secretly resented this. However, there was one brave man, Shimei, who came out and started to curse David. So when Abishai heard this, he tried to kill Shimei, but David stopped him. David accepted Shimei's words and curse. David knew that this was his punishment for killing the innocent Raya. David therefore did not kill Shimei and walked away from the situation. David knew then that it was not only Shimei who disapproved of him as king. It may be that the Lord will look upon my misery and restore me to his covenant blessing instead of his curse today. Third point, Counselor Ahithophel changed the rumors about Absalom's coup d'etat to a real coup d'etat. In order to let Israel know that he was the new king, Absalom put Ahithophel at the forefront. There were a few people who had doubts about Absalom's coup d'etat and what the future held, so Absalom wanted to make sure that all was clear. So Ahithophel advised Absalom to sleep with his father's concubines to show the people that he had truly usurped the power. As such, David was punished severely for killing Uriah. The first punishment was that the sword would never leave David's household, and the second was that David would also have his wife taken away. Fourth point, Hushai used the common psychology of coup d'etat to make Ahithophel's plan fail. When Hushai arrived in Absalom's territory, Ahithophel sensed that Hushai was sent by David. Absalom called both Ahithophel and Hushai to put an end to this coup d'etat. The main point was to consider how to catch David. The fate of David and Absalom now rested in the hands of Ahithophel and Hushai. Ahithophel's plan was to take 12,000 soldiers to capture David. After hearing Ahithophel's plan, Absalom now wanted to hear Hushai's plan. But Hushai had a plan to shake up Absalom's judgment. 
who say told Absalom that David had been very successful in hiding from Saul when he tried to capture him with 3,000 trained young men, and so this would be a bad idea. So Hushai advised Absalom to gather all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and for Absalom to lead them. Just in case Absalom listened to Ahithophel, Hushai also made David free somewhere else. Fifth point. When Ahithophel's plan failed, he cleared his desk and went back to his hometown to kill himself. Ahithophel sensed that Absalom agreed with Hushai. It may have been that Ahithophel knew what was going to happen when Hushai entered in the first place. When Ahithophel saw that his advice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey and set out for his house in his hometown. He put his house in order and then hanged himself. So he died and was buried in his father's tomb. We wonder why Ahithophel killed himself even though the end result had not yet shown. This was because Ahithophel knew that David would return to power. Then we wonder why Ahithophel did not warn Absalom that Hushai was David's man. This was because Ahithophel knew that if he said this to Absalom, who was a lucky politician, Absalom would just think that Ahithophel was jealous of Hushai. David knew his son Absalom and so sent Hushai. But Absalom did not know his father and so accepted Hushai. David was able to use the time earned by Hushai to flee to safety. Day 109 to Samuel 18 to 20 The story of Coup de Tat III in the Coup. Absalom's rebellion ended up failing and David returned to the palace and tried to sort out the situation. However, the emotional chasm existing among the nation was not easy to mend. First point. Ahithophel kills himself and Absalom dies in the hands of Joah. When the people of Israel heard that David was to come out against Absalom, the men said to David not to go out. David agreed to this and made the people promise that they would not kill his son. Eventually, war broke out. David won this battle, and Absalom's coup d'etat came to a complete end. Unfortunately, this cost 20,000 lives. Absalom tried to learn away, but his long hair got caught in a tree. The one man from David's side caught Absalom's stock. Knowing that David did not wish to kill his own son, the man took Joab there. But like the time Joab just killed Abuna, he also just killed Absalom. So eventually, the two people who planned the coup d'etat both died. Ahithophel killed himself and Absalom died in the hands of Joab. Second point, Joab was a complex person to David. Although Absalom's army outnumbered David's army led by Joab, David still saw victory. Although Joab brought David victory, he disobeyed him by killing Absalom. David was glad of the outcome, but he was sad at the news of Absalom's death. Although Absalom committed treason, he was still David's son. David believed that Absalom died because of his sin, and so he cried with guilt and remorse. When the people of Israel saw that David lamented for Absalom, they lamented with him. Joab tried to convince David to come out from lamenting. So David listened to Joab and returned as king. Joab was someone who advised, who disobeyed, who also obeyed and was like a friend to David. Indeed, 
He was a complex person. Third point, David returned as a king through bringing out the priestess and the tribe of Judah. After the fall of Absalom, the twelve tribes came together to discuss David's return. Prior to this, they had anointed Absalom as a king. Thus, they had to organize the logistics of bringing David back as a king. So David brought out the priestess and the tribe of Judah in order to settle this. David furthermore recruited Amasa, who had helped Absalom as the new commander of the army. This was in order to settle the feud between the two sides. But this incident later became a problem between the tribe of Judah and the rest of the tribes. This whole incident with Absalom did indeed bring a great deal of trouble to David. Fourth point, David gained a few things from Absalom's coup d'etat. After defeating Absalom's coup d'etat, there was Shimei and a thousand men from the tribe of Benjamin waiting for David in Jerusalem. David granted Shimei forgiveness. David used this opportunity to bring the tribe of Benjamin closer to him. Shimei knew that the reason David saved him was because he wanted Shimei to bring the hidden thousand men out. If Shimei and the hidden men did not come out here, it would have been very troublesome later for Solomon. Jonathan's son Mephibosheth also welcomed David. Mephibosheth was always grateful to David for taking him in. Another person to welcome David was Bajilei, who helped David during his time of learning away. David offered Vajilei to come to Jerusalem with him, but he declined. However, he asked David to look after his son instead. Although it was very difficult to handle Absalom's coup d'etat, David was able to bring together the people from the tribe of Benjamin in the process. Fifth point, the incident of Sheba marked the end of Absalom's coup d'etat. On his way back to Jerusalem, Sheba, who was from the tribe of Benjamin, caused another uproar. The other tribes had a grudge against the tribe of Judah for operating David's return to Jerusalem on their own terms. The tribe of Judah explained that it was all because they were supporting David. They also explained that they did not get extra privilege for being in tribe of Judah from David. But there was a man named Sheba who was from the tribe of Benjamin. As soon as David returned to Jerusalem, he had to plan a battle against Sheba. In this process, Joab used this chaotic atmosphere to kill Amasha, who was given his place. He killed Amasha the way he had simply killed Abner and Absalom. When David's army tried to attack the army of Sheba, they hid in Abel Beth Makkah. But a wise woman intervened. Due to this wise woman, the people of Abel were able to avoid being called traitors. With this, David was finally able to see the end of the coup d'etat and rebuild the country peacefully. Day 110 to Samuel 21 to 22. A soldier makes a soldier. By accepting the request of the people of Gibeon, David tried to settle the past and praised God whilst reflecting on his past life. First point, the three years of famine during David's monarchy was because Saul failed to keep the covenant that was made during the days of Gibeon. During the reign of David, there was a famine for three successive years, so David sought the face of the Lord. This story has its roots in the times of Joshua. When Joshua was conquering land, there was an instant when the people of Gibeon tried to fool Joshua. 
in order to establish peace with Israel. And then after that, Saul killed the people thereby going against the promise. And so God said, it is an account of Saul and his blood-stained house. It is because he put the Gibeonites to death. God so brought famine on the land to make Israel realize this. This famine lasted for three years. Second point, David held the funeral for all the members of Saul's family. In order to solve the issue of the famine that occurred for three years during the days of David, David went to the people of Gibeon to ask them a few questions. What the people of Gibeon requested was the seven people from the house of Saul so that they could punish them. So David listened to their request and sent them two of Saul's sons and five of his grandchildren. But in order to keep his covenant with Jonathan, he did not send Mephibosheth and protected him until the end. Among the people that were sent, two were the sons born from Saul's concubine, Lizpah. This incident exposed how Lizpah had protected the dead bodies of her sons from the animals. David heard of this and carried out the funeral for the remaining members of Saul's family. After David carried out the funeral for the family members of Saul, the three years of famine came to an end. We remember that Moses also conducted countless funerals. Both Moses and David conducted numerous funerals during their time as leaders. Third point. The matter of who fights in war is a secondary matter. Back when David was a teenager, he had already fought with bears, lions, and even Goliath. Afterwards, David spent many of his days fighting more battles. He was always a courageous warrior. God had given David the ability to fight with Goliath and Leitan. God gave abilities to Israel to win battles. As such, who fights is a secondary matter. Battles belong to God. We come across those who fought for David. There was Abishai who killed the giant Ishbi ben Op to save David. The next was Sibekai who also killed a giant. The third was Elhanan who killed the brother of Goliath. The fourth was Jonathan, who also killed those who cursed Israel. David killed the giant Goliath, and then after him, others killed in order to maintain and protect the kingdom of priests. Fourth point, like Moses sang God's praises before he died, David also sang God's praises before he died. The leader of Exodus, Moses, sang of God's Prizes. God called Moses his servant. God also called David his servant. David also sang God's praises. David sang of God's salvation by using metaphors such as rock, shelter, and refuge. He said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge and my savior. From violent people you save me. He asked God for help when he was in distress. He also confessed that it was only through God's law and by him being faithful to it that he could live a blessed and fulfilling life. Fifth point, David sang that he would praise for the rest of his life. Therefore, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing the praises of your name. He gives his king great victories. He shows unfailing kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. David's praise expanded beyond him to all the people of all nations. 
At times, it was difficult for David to protect himself. He had to escape from the sword of Saul and then had to experience countless hardships. But David always had a vision of praising God. Day 111, 2 Samuel 23-24 The census in Numbers versus David's census. Before dying, David left his last words. Realizing his mistakes about taking the census, he truly repented and accepted his punishment. First point. David received God's covenant through the prophets Moses, Samuel, Nathan, and God. All throughout his life, David always prayed for the heaven's doors to open. David always valued God's covenant and was always keen to listen to the words of the prophets. David never let go of the laws of the kingdom of priests recorded by Moses. He always sang of God's laws, God's teachings, and God's covenants recorded in the Pentateuch. David lived his life by following God's commands, and he received a covenant through the prophet Samuel. David also received God's covenant through the prophet Nathan. David also accepted his punishments told by the prophet God after he took census with the long intentions. As such, God always used his prophet to set a kingdom of priests straight and also to deliver his message. Second point, a courageous soldier makes a courageous soldier. All of God's people in the Bible experienced fear, but they all managed to succeed by asking God for courage. David also experienced many instances of deep fear, but he managed to overcome them through seeking God's help. David also managed to encourage those who were around him to become courageous soldiers. The central army of David was led by Joab and his 30 soldiers. Other notable mentions are Benaya as well as the 37 soldiers who were always alongside David. David made a note of the soldiers who were particularly at his side and loyal during his battles. Third point, the census taken during Numbers was different to the census taken by David. Census was taken soon after Exodus in order to set up a kingdom of priests. It was in order to count those who were able to go to battle. It was also in order to organize the logistics of the offering. It also had the intent of finding out the number to distribute the land of Canaan. But the purpose of David's census was in order to find out how much he managed to expand his army. David commanded Joab to take census. This behavior was drastically different to the David in the early days when all he believed in was God. In other words, David took census not with the heart to do something for a kingdom of priests, but entirely to see his own accomplishments. David already knew that battles did not depend on numbers, but on God. But in his later years, David had a proud moment and wanted to find out how much his military power had grown. Fourth point, David realized that his emphasis on numbers was long. When David repented of his sins after taking census, God told David through the prophet God that he was to choose one of the three punishments. The first was seven years of famine. The second was being chased for three months. The third was a disease for three days. 
David chose the third punishment. Due to this, 70,000 Israel people died because of the disease. This was the penalty for the price of David taking census. When 70,000 people died because of him, David knelt down and thoroughly repented once more and prayed for the punishment to be brought on him and his household rather than on the people. Fifth point, Mount Moriah, where Abraham and Isaac offered their offering, became the ground for David and Solomon's temple a thousand years later. When God heard David's repentance, he sent the prophet God to tell David that he was to make an offering to receive forgiveness. So David set up an altar on the threshing floor of Arauna to God to ask for forgiveness. The place David offered this was the place Abraham had offered Isaac to God a thousand years ago. This was also the place where Solomon later built the Jerusalem temple. Day 112, 1 Kings 1-2, to Spiritual Will, Political Will. David nullified Adonijah's rebellion, handed his throne over to Solomon, left a religious and political will with him, and then finished his life in this world. First point, a kingdom of priests and the kingdom of God was connected through an oath and a vision. The Bible is pieced together through the framework of a kingdom of priests and the kingdom of God and ultimately through God's vision. Jacob's vision was towards the promised land Canaan and he unraveled his vision by blessing his twelve sons. Joseph's vision was also towards Canaan after Exodus. Moses' vision was to make a holy citizens in a kingdom of priests. David's vision passed down to Solomon concerning God's laws. Jesus' vision was the Andes of the earth. Paul's vision was for the second generation of apostles to carry out God's work. As such, God's people left their will, which became the root for Christians to follow today. Second point, David, through the priest Zadok, passed on his monarchy to Solomon. When David grew old, David's fourth son, Adonijah, carried out a coup d'etat just like Absalom did. Adonijah rose up against his father to show that he was more suited to being king than Solomon. He also wanted to show that he was approved by the others and that he was good looking. He also had an army of followers to support his coup d'etat. If Absalom had Ithophel behind his coup, Adonijah had Joab and Abiathar. Adonijah used the same format as his brother Absalom for the coup, using the help of Joab and Abiathar as well as his 50 soldiers. When the prophet Nathan became aware of this, he went to Bathsheba and told her to seek David to ensure that Solomon would sit on the throne. David gathered those who were not involved in Adonijah's coup and ordered them to support Solomon's enthronement. So Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah son of Jehoiada, the Kerisites and the Pelasites went down and had Solomon mount King David's mule, and they escorted him to Kihon. Sadok the priest took a horn of oil from the sacred tent and anointed Solomon. Then they sounded the trumpets and all the people shouted, Long live King Solomon! Solomon officially took the place of David as king and this drove away Adonijah's followers. Adonijah, in fear of Solomon, took hold of the horns of the altar. Solomon told Adonijah, 
that he could live and took a home on the condition that he did not pursue the throne again. Third point, David left his will of faith to Solomon first. David left his son Solomon an oath of a kingdom of priests. The reason why David's 40-year rule out of the 500 years of monarchy was so acknowledged was because David managed to devote himself to a kingdom of priests. Many kings, including Saul, failed to keep to a kingdom of priests. But David really sets a model example of how kings were to live according to God's laws. Later on, Jeroboam took a completely different path to David by changing the three annual festivals in a kingdom of priests. He failed to recognize that a kingdom of priests had God's forgiveness, sharing between neighbors, and peace between nations. David truly believed in this and passed this down to Solomon. Fourth point, David also left his political will to Solomon. The political will David left Solomon was twofold. The first was to be cautious of Joab and Shimei. The content regarding Joab can be found in 1 Kings 2 verses 5 to 6. David advised to find an opportunity to kill Joab. The second regarded Shimei, and the content can be found in 1 Kings 2, verses 8 to 9. Solomon was warned to also kill Shimei. The second part of David's will was for Solomon to search wide for skilled people all over the country. The content of David's political will cast light on what a great politician he was. Joab and Shimei were not too much a threat to a senior politician such as David, but to Solomon, they could be threatening. Thus, David told Solomon the best way to deal with them. Fifth point, for the first three years of his monarchy, Solomon fulfilled all the contents of David's political will. Solomon managed to achieve a lot during the first three years as king. One thing he did was to kill Adonijah and strengthen his internal cabinet. The death of Adonijah was brought about by Adonijah himself because he tried to make Bathsheba help him get Abishag the Shunammite as his wife. Because of this, Adonijah was put to death on that day. Solomon furthermore exiled those who supported Adonijah from the country. As for Abiatha, Solomon did not kill him, but disqualified him from position as a priest. Solomon also killed Joab, who was with Adonijah for the coup d'etat. Solomon made Benaiah command of the army and furthermore also killed Shimei. Solomon managed to achieve all this in three years. He learned a lot from his father and this surprised all the surrounding countries. Day 113, 1 Kings 3-4 Solomon's Mind Trial God gave Solomon, who asked for wisdom, even wealth and glory in addition, and as a result, Israel came to enjoy great prosperity. First point, Solomon fulfilled David's faith will after fulfilling the political will. As Solomon was building the temple for the first few years of his monarchy, the people of Israel were making offerings in the tent. During this time, Solomon went to Gibeon and offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. And so, God appeared to Solomon in his dream. Solomon, in his dream, thanked God for all the blessings God had given to him and his household. Solomon also told God, that he was young and did not know how to carry out his duties. 
Solomon therefore asked for wisdom to rule over his people wisely. Judging was an important role of the king, and so Solomon asked God for appropriate wisdom. God who heard this prayer not only granted him wisdom, but also wealth and glory as well. Second point, what was faster than a DNA test was a heart test. During the early years of Solomon's rule, there was an unsolved instance which became such an issue that it came before the king. Solomon ended up solving this issue that had grown into national news. Two prostitutes both gave birth to a son three days apart. One woman's son died as she lay on him. So she took the other son in the middle of the night and claimed that it was her son. If this incident broke out today, it would have been solved immediately through a DNA test. But back in those days, it was a huge matter. And the entire people turned to the 20-year-old Solomon to see how he would solve this. At this, Solomon said, cut the living child in two, and give half to one and half to the other. When the real mother heard the sound of the sword being released, she cried out immediately and gave up her child. Solomon knew right away that the real mother gave up her rights in order to save her son's life. As David had hit the lion and the bear's pressure point straight away, Solomon hit the exact pressure point of the real mother. Everyone gave a huge thumbs up to David's son. Third point, Solomon's wisdom was revealed through his ability to observe the honest heart. Now Solomon became famous for his wisdom all around the country. Solomon managed the country by establishing 12 administrative divisions, and they were managed strategically. The reason for these 12 divisions was in order to make tax collecting systematic. Another reason was to blow out the focus on tribes. Furthermore, this system enabled the priests to have a priority role in the community. Fourth point, the characteristics of Solomon's early rule were that there was no personal, regional, or national conflict. During the days of Solomon, there was no personal, regional, or national conflict. There was no fighting between other countries, and from Dan to Beersheba, all was at peace. This was all down to God's justice and the rightful ruling of Solomon passed down from David. There was great prosperity in the days of Solomon. There was also no serious conflict with the surrounding countries. The palace and the people all enjoyed abundance, and Israel had a stable army during this time. Fifth point. Solomon's wisdom was beyond the discipline of humanities, social science, and natural science. Solomon was someone who exceeded his reputation. He was the wisest person who wrote 3,000 proverbs and 1,005 songs. His knowledge went beyond humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences. People from all around the region came to hear of Solomon's wisdom. Day 114, 1 Kings 5-7, founding 1,000 years of the temple. Solomon launched building the temple on the strong foundation handed down from David painstakingly built it for seven years and then built his palace for thirteen years afterwards. First point, the age of the 500-year moving tabernacle came to a cross and the new age of the 1,000-year Jerusalem temple opened. 
right after Exodus, God had told his people that there would be a designated place. God's ark, since then, lasted at the tent of meeting for 500 years. Then Jericho, Kiriath Jerim, the house of Obed Edom, and then the Jerusalem temple. And thus began the 1,000 year Jerusalem temple. Solomon put forth lots of labor to build the temple. With the construction of the Jerusalem temple, Jerusalem became the center not only for religious but for political purposes. Second point, Israel and Tyre made an international treat through the construction of the Jerusalem temple. Solomon used the international relations built during the years of his father between Tyre for the construction of the temple. Tyre actively involved itself in the construction of the Jerusalem temple. Solomon asked Hiram, the king of Tyre, for an architect. The reason Solomon asked Tyre for both an architect and materials was because Israel did not have much trees for wood and lacked technical architects. Tyre had cedar wood and other good materials suitable for the temple construction, and so Solomon requested the help from Hira. In return, Israel provided Tyre with grain and other goods. Third point, Bezalel and Oholiab led the making of the tabernacle, and Adoniram and Hiram led the construction of the Jerusalem temple. 500 years ago, Bezalel and Oholiab dedicated themselves to building the Ark of God on Mount Sinai. Now, it was time to make a temple that would last a thousand years. For this, Adoniram and Hiram were given the job. Adoniram was an especially important person in the architectural construction of the temple. Adoniram was a skilled technician during the days of David, Solomon, and also Rehoboam. A great deal of time, energy, and labors were put forth for the temple construction. 3,300 people overlooked the whole procedure. The ground of the temple was the grounds of Mount Moriah, where Abraham and Isaac had made an offering to God. This was also the same place where David made the offering for the sins of taking census. Fourth point, God's eyes were focused on the heart of Solomon who constructed the temple. The temple construction involved hiring workers from all around in order to complete both the exterior and the interior. The exterior construction of the temple was carried out in a faraway location so that the heating of iron tools would not be heard in Jerusalem. The interior of the temple involved building the walls for the most holy place, holy place, the grounds, and also the court of the Gentiles. Solomon plated the interior of the temple with gold. The outside of the temple is presumed to have been divided for the women, the Israelites, and also the other nations. During the process of building the temple, God appeared to Solomon. God acknowledged Solomon's work and also reminded him of the covenant God had made with David concerning the temple. God showed that he cared more about Solomon's heart to build the temple more so than the actual building of the temple. Fifth point, historically, the temple became constructed twice, according to God's design and once according to political command. The temple David prepared and Solomon built was completed in seven years. The foundation of the temple of the Lord was laid in the fourth year in the month of Ziv. In the eleventh year, in the month of Bull, the eighth month, the temple was finished in all its details according to its specifications. He had spent seven years building it. 
The reason it did not take too long was because God had already given them the design. It had also been prepared by David. Moreover, all the materials required were prepared in advance. It also helped that the Israel people were all dedicated to this process. They had skilled workers, and as the design given by God was for a modest-sized building, the temple was not that big. But this temple was burned down by the Babylonian soldiers in 586 BC. Seventy years later, the temple was reconstructed by the captives who returned according to the design given by God. Afterwards, Herod built his temple, but he only cared about the exterior. He replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? As such, the temple was built a few times. The first was by Solomon, and then the returned captives from Persia, and then during the Roman Empire. Day 115, 1 Kings 8, The Prayer of Dedication, International Politics, Carrying the Ark of Covenant into the completed temple, Solomon declared before the entire congregation that this temple would become the one for all the nations. First point, 10 instances can be found in regards to the process of the 500-year moving tabernacle being placed from Mount Sinai to Jerusalem. First, the tabernacle was designed during the days of Moses. Second, the ark stayed with the Israel people for 40 years in the desert. Third, the priests took the ark on their shoulders and crossed the Jordan River. Fourth, the ark went to Gilgal after arriving in Canaan. Fifth, the priests carried the ark into Jericho. Sixth, Hophni and Phinehas took the ark with them during the battle against the Philistines. Seventh, the ark was carried back from Kiriath-Jerim. Eighth, David brought the ark back from Kiriath-Jerim to Jerusalem but stopped in the middle due to the death of Uzzah, which meant that it was taken to the house of Obed-Edom. Ninth, the ark was moved from the house of Obed-Edom to Jerusalem. At last, the ark was placed inside the temple of Jerusalem and into the most holy place. These ten instances make up the story of the history behind the 500-year moving tabernacle. Second point, God's clouds filled the place with glory when the ark was first placed in the tabernacle and also when it was placed inside the Jerusalem temple. All the Israelites came together to King Solomon at the time of the festival in the month of Ethanim, which was the seventh month. And as commanded in the rose, the ark was moved into the most holy place. And there, God's presence was to dwell. Third point, Solomon's prayer of dedication contained God's desire to bless all nations. The highlight of the opening of the temple was Solomon's prayer of dedication. This prayer truly showed the wisdom of Solomon. Solomon swore an oath to God. He also made a reference to Leviticus chapter 26 and the three levels of punishment and the prayer of the captives, all according to a kingdom of priests. Solomon also prayed for the days of famine that is recorded in Leviticus chapter 26. Solomon continued to pray for the first and second level of punishments also recorded in Leviticus chapter 26. Solomon, furthermore, 
pride the food of foreigners who would come and pray in the court of the Gentiles. The tabernacle which was made on Mount Sinai only had the holy place and the most holy place. But the design given by God for the temple contained the additional court of the Gentiles. This was in order to bless all nations. Solomon's prayer of dedication set straight the aims of the temple as well as the core of a kingdom of priests. Fourth point, Daniel prayed towards Jerusalem three times a day, and this was based upon Solomon's prayer of dedication. During the 70 years in Babylon as a captive, Daniel prayed three times a day facing Jerusalem. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make a request of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Daniel's prayer had its roots in Solomon's prayer of dedication. As Solomon prayed, Daniel looked to God during the time of captivity whilst looking towards Jerusalem. Fifth point, during the dedication of the tabernacle, the people offered for 12 days. And during the dedication of the temple, the people offered for 14 days. Back when the tent of tabernacle was being set up, the people gave offerings for 12 days in Mount Sinai. Now in the temple, the people gave offerings for 14 days. Solomon first blessed the Israelites. Solomon then told the people to follow the laws. Solomon then offered the first offering in the temple with the people of Israel. This went on for 14 days. The offerings made during the 14 days were shared between the people. Thus, everyone from the 12 tribes of Israel was able to enjoy the offering of the temple. Day 116, 1 Kings 9-10 to The court of Gentiles for all nations. God asked Solomon to keep his laws and decrees and then poured great grace and abundance in his era. First point, like the time before entering Canaan, the regulations regarding blessings and the causes became reiterated with the completion of the construction of the temple and the palace. Right from the start, God had told the people through Moses of the blessings and the curses they would receive based on whether they obeyed or disobeyed God's commands. Likewise, with the opening of the temple, it was once again reiterated how the people would be blessed or cursed depending on their obedience to God. God emphasized to Solomon that it was important that his heart was in keeping with a kingdom of priests. God also one of the curses that would follow if Israel did not keep to the covenant. Second point, David ruled through battles and Solomon ruled through architectural constructions. David fought since his youth and his whole life after that was full of battles. These battles helped strengthen the country. David had devoted a great deal of energy into stabilizing the country that during the days of Solomon. The country was finally at peace. Solomon was able to use the energy elsewhere and so he focused on architectural constructions. After constructing the temple, he started building his palace. For this, he used the Canaan slaves. However, he did not make the Israel people into slaves as per the law. 
Third point, Solomon led the country to prosperity through enabling the people to keep the three annual festivals of the kingdom of priests. During the days of Solomon, all the Israelites from Dan to Beersheba enjoyed prosperity. As Israel had made a business out of construction, the people were able to live in abundance. This was possible due to Solomon enabling the people to keep the three annual festivals of the kingdom of priests and also through international trade. Fourth point, the queen of Sheba prayed in the court of the Gentiles when she visited the Jerusalem temple. With the expansion of international relations during the days of Solomon, and especially with Hiram, the king of Tyre, trading with Israel, the surrounding countries started to come to Israel for various reasons. One of these people was the queen of Sheba. The queen of Sheba wanted to test the Solomon's wisdom as well as the opportunities for trade. When she came, she realized that God had granted Solomon an incredible amount of wisdom. Her visit made historical records. She claimed that Solomon's wisdom was greater than his reputation. She also stated that the people of Israel were blessed to be able to hear Solomon's wisdom. She furthermore sang God's praises and gave gifts to Solomon. During her visit, she visited the Jerusalem temple and also Solomon's palace. Even though she was royalty, because she was not an Israelite, she had to go to the court of the Gentiles according to the laws of the kingdom of priests. Fifth point, Solomon's international relations became a path for blessing all nations. All of Solomon's wisdom came from God. But an unfortunate thing for Solomon compared to David was that he was not as sensitive to a kingdom of priests to the same extent as his father. According to God's laws, a king was not permitted to gather too many possessions or wives. But Solomon disobeyed this command. Solomon was not obedient to the laws in Deuteronomy. He failed to remember that the reason God gave him wisdom and wealth was because his father had obeyed a kingdom of priests, and because it appeared that he would adjure. But as time progressed, his heart shifted from God. Day 117, Proverbs 1 to 5, Wisdom not found in this world. Solomon, who candidly revealed what wisdom was through Proverbs, stressed that the source of wisdom was in the attitude of fearing God. First point, there is a difference between what the world teaches and what the Bible teaches. The world teaches that wisdom is about understanding how the world works and how to go about earthly situations. However, the Bible teaches that true wisdom is blessing, forgiveness, love, and mercy. The Bible furthermore teaches that living according to God's will and God's laws is true wisdom. Solomon recorded in Proverbs that obeying God was true wisdom. He was able to confidently state this as he himself received wisdom from God. Solomon knew that wisdom came from God and that wisdom comes from believing in God. Second point, Isaac, Solomon, Samuel, and Timothy all heard their fathers lovingly say, My son. Isaac once asked his father Abraham, The fire and wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And so Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. 
Isaac was ultimately able to learn about obedience through his father. David also taught his son Solomon. When the time drew near for David to die, he gave charity to Solomon, his son. I'm about to go the way of all the earth, he said. So be strong, act like a man, and observe what the Lord, your God, requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations as written in the laws of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go. David prayed to God that his son would follow God. Solomon later uses the term, my son, multiple times in Proverbs. This is something that a father says to a son and also what a teacher says to his student. As such, Solomon used my son in Proverbs to teach his sons and students about true wisdom. Solomon emphasized the importance of discipline and punishment. Discipline is love. Disciplining someone comes with a hope for them to become a better person. Third point. Solomon taught that wisdom comes from God. Solomon was someone who received a great deal of wisdom from God. God gave him wealth on top of wisdom for the reason that he did not seek material wealth. Solomon desired for wisdom in order for him to rule over God's people wisely. After experiencing God's wisdom, Solomon confidently recorded that his wisdom came from God. He recorded that true wisdom came from the heart more so than the brain. Fourth point, Solomon taught how to live a feeling life. There is no one who had as much wealth as Solomon. All King Solomon's goblets were gold and all the household articles in the palace of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Nothing was made of silver because silver was considered of little value in Solomon's days. But rather than being consumed by his wealth, Solomon said, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your butts will brim over with new wine. This was wisdom Solomon had learned from Moses. Solomon, furthermore, elaborated on the advantages of living a wise life. This can be seen in Proverbs 3, where he uses the terms do this, which is followed by, if you do, this will happen. Fifth point, wisdom is not something that you can maintain for the rest of your life. Solomon emphasized the importance of a heart when it came to wisdom. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Wisdom is not something one can have once and for all. A father's wisdom does not get transferred automatically to his son. That is why it is necessary to work hard to become wise. But ironically, Solomon had a period where his heart left God. Right from the start, Moses taught to put all your heart into serving God. God told Joshua to be brave and courageous. David said that he wished for his words and his heart to face God. Jesus said that we should learn his humble heart. Day 118, Proverbs 6-9 Crossroads between wisdom and foolishness We can meet true wisdom through deep fellowship with God, who is the master of wisdom and rules the world wisely. First point, wisdom must be expressed through daily activities. Solomon emphasized time and time again that obeying and believing in God was true wisdom. 
the opposite of wisdom is foolishness. Foolishness comes from laziness. The time God grants us on this earth is what we live by in front of God. If we use this time foolishly, then we are foolish people. We cannot be wise if we are lazy or are selfish. It is important that we offer our unmost to God and do His work. Second point, a wise person can overcome any type of seduction. The wisdom Solomon emphasized was a life obeying and fearing God. He taught that we should not be seduced by earthly seductions. We should always be wary of what we are seduced by and be able to control our foolish desires. Joseph was a very wise person. Thus, Joseph was able to overcome the seduction of a Potiphar's wife. Jonathan was also a very wise person. Hence, he was able to keep his faith despite his father's seduction to kill David. There were also many foolish people in the Bible. An example is Amnon, who was fooled by his cunning friend. Because of this, he ended up being killed by Absalom. Third point, wisdom is more valuable than any material object. Solomon claimed that one who was given wisdom was the one who had something more valuable than anything else. During David's days, there was a foolish man named Nabal who chose stupidity. Nabal made the decision to ridicule David rather than to help him. There was also a young man during David's days that lied that he had killed Saul, when in fact Saul had committed suicide. This was in hopes that David would repay him with goods. But he was put to death straight away because of this. Different to these people was Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan. During Absalom's coup d'etat against David, he stuck by David and shared his pain. Mephibosheth was able to gain David's trust and respect by acting wisely. Fourth point, wisdom existed before creation and it exists in God. Wisdom was created after God created the universe. Solomon claimed that God's wisdom began before the universe existed. Regarding God's wisdom, Paul claimed, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgment is, and his path beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Paul also said this to the Corinthian church. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand science and the Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and the foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Rather than relying on early wisdom, it is a much happier life learning God's wisdom, and to live in gratitude. Fifth point, all humans stand between wisdom and foolishness. Solomon claimed that God invites us all to be wise. 
Wisdom is something that people can claim if they decide to follow in God. But the problem lies when people succumb to regret and other emotions. That is why all humans stand somewhere between wisdom and foolishness. The Bible teaches us how we can be wise. The method is to obey God and to know God's laws. James tells us to ask for wisdom from God. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Day 119, Proverbs 10 to 15. Working with a wise person. Through clear distinction and the contrast between a righteous person and an evil person, Proverbs urged the readers to choose the righteous and wise path. First point. Remembering to cultivate crops is vital in order to offer to God. If one does not cultivate during harvest, all their hard work is bound to go to waste. All things have a start and a finish. People were able to take their grains to the temple to make an offering to God. The people were to take their first fruit during the festival of the harvest. And during the festival of the tabernacle, they thanked God for their good harvest. This was the laws of a kingdom of priests. It was important that the people offered to God and also shared with their neighbors. As such, the Israelites had to cultivate crops at the right time and to make offerings in due course in order to share joy with their neighbors. Second point, love overcomes all. Solomon claimed that love overcomes all flaws. Solomon wrote, Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. Love and hatred all start from the heart, and these emotions are revealed through words. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Sin is not ended up by multiplying words, but the prudent hold their tongues. Solomon repeatedly taught on the importance of words. Solomon's advice is for people to be selective on what they say. Third point, a sinner causes himself trouble with his own tongue. Solomon claimed that the difference between a righteous and a foolish person was in what they said. A righteous person's words could save a life, but a foolish person's words could do the opposite. The words said out loud reveals what is in the heart. A righteous person would say beautiful words, whereas a foolish person would say harmful words. This would make their neighbors joyful or hurtful. It is so important what we say to one another. This can be seen most vividly in what the two lovers said to Jesus whilst being crucified. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Fourth point, a humble person is open to wisdom. God is the creator and humans are God's creation. Therefore, humans must accept limitations and be humble. Obeying God and being humble is the core of wisdom. 
We as creations must be humble in front of our Creator God. In the Bible, we can see how Moses accepted the advice from his father in law, Jethro. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. Oppositely, the foolish king of South Judah, Zedekiah, did not listen to the words of Jeremiah, and so ended up having the worst outcome. When Jeremiah advised him to quickly surrender to Babylon, He said to Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews who have gone over to the Babylonians, for the Babylonians may hand me over to them and they will mistreat me. So Jeremiah said, Obey the Lord by doing what I tell you. Then it will go well with you and your life will be spared. Zedekiah, who did not listen to Jeremiah until the very end, ended up seeing his sons being killed in front of him by the Babylonians. Fifth point, working alongside a wise person is the way to gain wisdom. Solomon said that it was important to befriend wise people in order to become wise. The Bible records a few of such cases. The first is Joshua and Caleb. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephne, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephne, the Kenesite, ever since. Because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. The second is David and Jonathan. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. The third is David and Hushai. So Hushai, David's confidant, arrived at Jerusalem, and Absalom was entering the city. The fourth is Esther and Mordecai. So Queen Esther, daughter of Abihail, along with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm this second letter concerning Purim. The fifth is Daniel and his three friends. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy for the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the last of the wise men of Babylon. The success is Paul and Barnabas. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. The seventh is Paul and Onesimus and also Philemon. Yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an older man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. The Bible also records bad friendships. The first is Ammon and Joab. The second is Rehoboam and his friends. Our greatest friend is Jesus Christ. Day 120, Proverbs 16 to 20. 
victory of the yield. We need wisdom of knowing that true happiness of life is not in the quantity of our possession, but in establishing beautiful relations with God and neighbors. First point, what we should do is to trust God in all that He does. To humans belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and He will establish your plans. The world teaches us that we must work hard and manage our time effectively in order to be successful. But Proverbs teaches us that God manages all and that although we are all different, God has a plan for each of us. Solomon teaches that birth, blessings, punishment, and death are all in the hands of the Lord. Therefore, if we think this is all down to us, we will never be able to receive God's blessings. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. To these people, God said, Come, let's go down and confuse their language, so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel. Because there, the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Second point. Humans cast lots, but the one to decide is ultimately God. The Lord is cast into the lab, but its every decision is from the Lord. There are lots of examples in the Bible where humans cast lots, but God made the final decisions. One example is when the Israelites arrived in Canaan and they started to cast lots between the twelve tribes. This method was also used when choosing a king. Again, we see this when David chose the ones to sing in the choir. It happened also when Jonah was about to be swallowed by a fish. Another example is when they cast lots for the people who would live in Jerusalem. Casting lots was also used after the betrayal of Judas Iscariot, when the disciples selected the sermon in his place. As such, there are things that humans can do, but the ultimate decision is always made by God. Third point, calming down anger is more difficult than taking over a fortress. Back in those times, a true warrior was someone who fought ferociously and took over a fortress. But the Bible teaches that one who is slow to anger is the greater warrior. Better a patient person than a warrior one with self-control than one who takes a city. Therefore, calming down one's anger is more difficult than taking over a fortress. We can see how God was slow to anger and fast to forgive. A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. Solomon therefore taught us how to be slow in anger and not pick on other people's flaws. This was in order to follow God, and he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and the gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. 
Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Fourth point: Someone who takes care of others will do well in whatever they do and have the blessing of good health. The wise Solomon said, "Many carry favor with a ruler, and everyone is the friend of one who gives gifts." Someone who helps another without any political or other intent is a truly kind person. The Bible states that God values such people. An example in the Bible of such a person was Barzillai, who granted David kindness in the time of difficulty. David did not forget this kindness and passed on blessing to Barzillai's son. Later on, the act of sharing and being kind was made into a festival called Purim. The Purim festival started with Esther and Mordecai to remember the day the Jews were saved, as well as to make this day a day of kindness and sharing. Another person who showed kindness was Gaius, whom John thanked for his generosity. Towards the apostles and the Christians, in AD 64, with the Great Fire of Rome, it became incredibly difficult for Christians to evangelize or even praise God. But a man named Gaius offered his house for the Christians and apostles to sleep and rest, and also provided them with funds on their way. John wrote to Caius, "Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health, and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well." It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to work in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are working in the truth. We should also try to act like Caius. Fifth point: Having compassion for the poor lends to the Lord. Solomon said, "Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and He will reward them for what they have done." Solomon emphasized that God's eyes are always on the poor and the weak. God's laws in a kingdom of justice is centered on looking after the weak, the widowed, the foreigners, and the orphans. God called the act of looking after them holy. God promised that if we looked after the weak, He would reward us. Look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done.